Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at a dual rank 8 gigabit Samsung VDI DDR4 overclock with Intel 13th gen, uh, because Asgard sent over one of their low key 3600 14 15 15 35 1.45 volt XMP memory kits. So, a pretty typical high end uh, XMP profile for a dual rank uh, Samsung VDI, you know, DDR4 kit, uh, 8 gigabit. BDI. I'm not sure if there's a 16 gigabit. If there is, it probably sucks, but 8 gigabit is the, that's the good stuff, right? Uh, for DDR4. Actually, it's the best stuff for DDR4. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so Asgard sent this over. Uh, I did specifically request this, like, very RGB heat spreader because it's a rather unique RGB effect. Like, yeah, um, so it looks, I'd argue it looks better in person than it does on camera, but, uh, yeah, it's not often that I get a memory kit where I don't just put the fan directly over the top of it, uh, because, yeah, I actually wanted it to be properly visible on camera. Though I kind of forgot about the AIO tubes, so <laughs> those are still covering it up. But, uh, yeah, this is dual rank Samsung B-Dye, so the memory sticks uh, can run rather hot, and Samsung B-Dye 8 gigabit DDR4 is pretty temperature sensitive, especially if you start pushing it. So I do have a fan uh, blowing onto the sticks from, from over here, right? So that just blows sort of like over them and in between them. And that does a perfectly acceptable job uh, of cooling mem uh, cooling them because uh, like RAM is like RAM can be temperature sensitive, but it doesn't actually produce a lot of heat. So what temperature your memory runs at is less about how much power the memory is pulling and much more about how little attention you put into cooling it, right? So, uh, yeah, th this is more than enough cooling, uh, even though I am actually pushing 1.55 volts into these sticks for the, the settings that we're running here. And we'll get to that shortly. Anyway, for the rest of the system, I'm using a Core i9-13900K, which was provided by Intel. And the motherboard is an MSI Z690 dash, uh, I mean, MSI Pro Z690 dash A DDR4 board. Uh, which I purchased, so big thank you to my supporters for making that purchase possible. Anyway, uh, I did test this memory kit on uh, a Asus Z690 Tough, and I also tested it on a uh, Gigabyte uh, Z690 Pro. And this board, this MSI board, out of all the boards that I've tried, was actually the best. Um, it's actually the Gigabyte board's actually kind of similarly capable to the MSI board, but the the tough I was having like really weird issues with with overclocking this memory kit on it. So uh, yeah, that's why we're using the MSI board here. I might also uh, retest this kit with the Gigabyte board because that showed some promising signs of maybe do being able to run like one T command rate or something. But my first priority with uh, really overclocking DDR4 on Intel 13th gen is to get the clock as high as possible. Um, because that helps you just get more performance, right? If the memory controller is clocked higher, you get less latency, uh, and the timings are kind of independent of what motherboard you're on. So, yeah, well, the exception to that being the one, t like, the, the command rate, but, uh, well, I didn't know ahead of time that the, the MSI board and the Gigabyte would, board would be so close together, and it didn't really feel like swapping boards a fourth time. So, uh, yeah, anyway, let's take a take a look at the actual settings that I'm running here. Um, so as you can see, uh, we have the full battery of stress test, but let's talk a little bit about the settings first. We're obviously going to go into more depth on those uh, once we get into the BIOS. For the memory speed, we're at 4,000 uh, megabits per second. And uh, the reasoning for that is that this 13900K's memory controller is not actually the worst 13th gen DDR4 memory controller I have. But it really doesn't like, like, I tried it at 4133, and I think the memory, I'm, well, yeah, I'm relatively certain that the memory could do 4133 with, like, CL15. Uh, I'm not sure if it would necessarily do TRCD15, but I can't really test that, because if I, like, run even primary timings, the system doesn't want to post for some reason. So, yeah, the Intel 13th gen memory... Like, the last good Intel DDR4 memory controller was the 10th gen DDR4 memory controller, and since then, the memory controller has been really weird. Um, and, and with 12th, like, with the 12th gen and 13th gen, it, it hasn't really gotten better. So, like, my 13600K actually tops out at, like, 3900 for the memory speed. Past that, it's just completely incapable of running Y-Cruncher VST. It doesn't even matter what timings you're at, it just doesn't run. Um, well, maybe if you use, like, single-rank micron sticks, it might do a bit better because they put less stress on the memory controller, but single-rank micron sticks aren't exactly known for delivering 
you know, great level, like pr a lot of performance. So yeah, like if you're going to be running DDR4 with your, well, D I th so this is one issue is like, I mainly wanted this memory kit because uh, I have like other DDR4 platforms that I want to run it with. Um, it's just none of those are particularly relevant. Like, I'm really interested to see what this kit does with, like, 10th gen Intel, um, maybe 11th gen, and definitely with Ryzen 5000. Um, both APUs and, like, non-APUs, uh, and as well as the regular CPUs. Um, but sort of, like, I haven't done any DDR4 overclocking with Intel 13th gen yet, at least not with uh, dual rank memory sticks. And so, I, you know, this was sort of the, the first platform that I decided to test this on, because it's technically relevant hardware, even though I don't particularly think that DDR4 and 13th gen are a good combination, especially considering that the 13th gen memory controller is basically as, it, like, from, from what I can tell, it's really not any better than the 12th gen memory controller, and for some reason it has more memory latency. Like, I, with these settings on a 12th gen CPU, I'd be lo expecting slightly better latency results, but... Yeah, actually, the 13th gen memory controller has more, la like, yeah, it has a bit more latency than 12th gen just kind of across the board, so that just seems to be some kind of, and probably related to the ring getting bigger uh, to accommodate the extra e-cores. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, so the, the settings here, I really don't think this is maxing out this memory kit. This is maxing out the CPU, because 13th gen memory controllers are just amazing, truly a memory controller that exists. Anyway, so, yeah, 4,000, 15, 15, the timings are actually really quite tight. Uh, and in fact, these timings seem to mostly work at 4133, as in, like, you can sustain pretty long runs of various stress tests, but that 4133, there's, like, weird ish, like, one-off errors at, like, four hours into a stress test and stuff, and and I can't, like like I mentioned, I can't really loosen out the timings because the system just refuses to post. Also at 4133, the, you can really tell that the CPU is struggling because just getting through memory training takes forever. Um, and uh, yeah, with like, and this is one thing that's kind of annoying with uh, LGA 1700. If you're going to be running DDR4, you can't get a DDR4 motherboard with a postcode. So, but yeah, anyway, I thought this would be probably the most like, currently relevant config like the setup to run this memory kit with even though i don't think it's particularly like it's not the setup i'm most interested in but uh anyway um yeah so pri like good primary timings actually like really good if you think about it like trcd 15 at, at 4000 is very tight um and then for the secondaries, I mean, the TRRDs are... Actually, I wanted to do this when we get to the BIOS. Uh, too late. Um, <laughs> the TRRDs are just slammed. Like, they don't go any lower than that. TRFC at 300. This could probably go a bit lower, but with the refresh interval at 120,000, there's no point pushing the refresh cycle any lower. Like, it's just not going to make much of a performance difference when your refresh interval is 100,000 or is over 100,000 cycles. TRTPs at 8. Um... Might go a little bit low. Actually, no, I don't. Th at 4,000, I really don't think it will go any lower than that. T falls at 16, that doesn't go any lower. TCK is at 4, that's according to Intel's documentation, that's as low as the register goes. PCWL 14, which is just, well, TCWL could potentially go lower if I was willing to, like, raise the read to write timings potentially, because those, those two trade with each other for reasons we're not going to get into. Anyway, and then the tear cherries are pretty standard B die things. Um, except for the, like, read-to-read the -read same group and write-to-write -write same group, which are at 8, uh, instead of 6. Um, both 8 and 6 work. This isn't, like, a limitation of the memory kit, but, uh, from some testing that I've done, 8, uh, like, having the same group timings at 8 seems to perform better. Um, it especially helps the IDA, like, read bandwidth test for some reason, and in Linpack, I tested 8.4 versus, like, 6.4, and 6.4 was, like, very slightly slower um but it's like it's not enough of a like it's a such a small performance difference in any benchmark that i run because like it it's a it makes a big difference in the ida bandwidth test but i don't really respect ida as a benchmark so you know i've been trying to find like a different test to prove which set of timings is actually better and what i've been finding is like in linpack the difference is within margin of error basically 
Uh, with Pi Prime, it doesn't make really any difference. With Y Cruncher, it barely makes a difference. And so that's been, uh, yeah, so that, that's um, kind of uh, interesting. Though, Ida seems to really like 8.4 instead of 6.4, and Linpack seems to run, for me at least, a little bit faster with 8.4 instead of 6.4. So I ended up with 8.4. It might be related to, to some kind of like weird scheduling behavior inside the memory controller of like which, uh, which commands, like, like, well, how it like interleaves the bank groups or something. Because, uh, yeah, I can't really explain why 6.4 would be slower than 8.4, but across a few tests that I've run, it, it seems to be, or it's in margin of error. So if 8.4, like 8.477 at the very least isn't slower within like a measurable range, like, yeah, isn't measurably slower. So uh, 8.4 it is uh, for the uh, like back-to-back -back timings. I mean, I, I say 8.4, but really it's just the eight. That's the important part. The, the four is like, if your different group timing isn't at four, you're tuning your DDR4 wrong. Um, anyway. So yeah, the tertiaries were pretty tight. I do have round trip latency training enabled, but I am not sure that it's doing very much because these RTLs do seem kind of loose. Um, but I haven't like I'd need to test more motherboard. Like the the thing is, yeah, I basically have to like test more motherboards to to see if there's like uh, a note uh, noteworthy difference to be had there. And anyway, let's talk about the stress tests I run. So 800% HCMM test, no errors, of course. Uh, y Cruncher VST for an hour, right? 3,600 seconds over here. A hundred loops of Linpack. Now, Linpack spent the entire time thermal throttling because I'm cooling a 13900K with a 240mm AIO, and I forgot to raise the thermal limit. Uh, I also didn't really put that much effort into minimizing the core voltage, and I do have the E cores turned off because HCI just absolutely hates them. Technically, you can manually rebind all the worker threads to the P cores, but like I could just disable the E cores for the stress testing, and then you know you can turn them back on later, and then like rerun VST just to verify that the memory controller didn't get upset by that again. Um, then uh, for test mem five, I have four hours and. 20 minutes of uh, extreme one and to seven seven so yeah i do consider this uh completely stable and also the fact that like at 4000 the cpu doesn't have any like training issues or anything it's at 4133 it takes a suspiciously long time to post um from like a, a bios reset but at 4000 like this this runs great um so yeah i wish i had a 13th gen cpu with a stronger ddr4 controller but like my 13600K literally maxes out at 3900, and this 13900K maxes out at like 4000. Um, I guess I could also test this with the 12600KF that I have, because that seems to have the best DDR4 memory controller that I have access to for, for 12th gen. But obviously, I wanted to use this memory kit with like a currently relevant CPU rather than like last gen hardware. Because um, if I was just going for, like, the most optimal CPU for this memory kit, I'd probably pull out the 10900K or, like, a 5950X or uh, the Ryzen 5 5500 that I have. So, anyway. But, yeah, in terms of stability, this is uh, solid and, like, real. Like mo most of my complaints for this setup revolve around the CPU rather than the, the memory kit. Like, this is just a very salt, like, it's a high-end dual-rank Samsung B-Die kit. Um... So there's not really much to complain about here. Um, or really, well, there's not really anything to complain about with regards to the memory kit. So, anyway, oh, and in hardware info, we don't have any errors. So, yeah, this is fully stable. Now let's uh, take a look at how, uh, what went into getting this to actually pass all of these stress tests. Um, so, let's restart. And so here we are in the BIOS. So, yeah, 55 on all the E cores. This is just, I mean, all the P cores. This is just to, just for the stress testing is the, the way I have this set up. Um, and then the ring ratio is at 4.8. You can run high ring ratio on 13th gen even with the E cores enabled. That's no longer a problem that got fixed. Um, or 
like that got fixed a, a long like that, that's been fixed since 13th gen came out like 12th gen had a thing where you couldn't run high ring ratios if the e cores are enabled well uh intel fixed that with when when they designed 13th gen um anyway so like disabling the e cores in in with the goals of like raising your ring ratio that that's not a thing for 13th gen if you were wondering about that but anyway let's get to the memory settings so uh, depending on your CPU, you might find that the DRAM reference clock, you might have better success with like 100 megahertz or 133 MHz. Uh, this CPU on this motherboard with this BIOS version, uh, works best with the 133 uh, MHz, uh, DRAM reference clock. There's no performance impact to this. This is just like a pre-multiplier before the main memory ratio. Um, so this is just like how the clock for like how the memory clock gets generated it doesn't have any performance impacts i i've seen people talk about how like now it, it like how 133 is like worse than 100 or something no this literally just generates the frequency for your memory to work um so like this this isn't like this isn't like ryzen or something right that that would be your like gearing over here and obviously for optimal performance with ddr4 you want to be in gear one gear two can make sense for certain configurations if you're pushing like re like if you really need memory bandwidth and you don't care about latency um but generally speaking if you're setting up like a gaming system with a 13th gen cpu and ddr4 you want to be in gear one because that's going to get you the best memory latency and you don't really lose a whole lot of memory bandwidth um Anyway, uh, then for the deep memory speed, we're at like 4,000 gear one, which is 30 by one, uh, 1.33, right? That's, that's what the like 133 ratio affects. Cause if we go to the 100 ratio, there's also a 4,000 time, like 40 times a hundred option. Yeah. So you have like the 40 times a hundred option here. Uh, unfortunately the 40 times a hundred, well, depending on your CPU and your BIOS and your motherboard, you might find that the 40 times a hundred is actually less or more stable than the four, uh, than the 30 times 1.33. Um, but with this CPU on this motherboard with this BIOS, the 133, uh, megahertz ratio is just better. So yeah, that's why I also was trying to stabilize like 4133 and I gave up on 4100 because 4100 was very unstable. And 4100 is only accessible through the 100 ratio unless you want to do weird things with BCLK. I did, I like the, I'm not, so with 13th gen, there's no reason not to use the BCLK. Uh, it's not going to break your SSDs or anything like that. It's completely decoupled from the PCIe clock and like SATA clock and all that. But the thing is, it breaks IDA because, it, like, if you overclock your BCLK by ten percent, your IDA benchmark results will be ten percent higher, even if your, uh, even if your like actual real world bandwidth and latency is the same as at a hundred megahertz BCLK, right? Like IDA, uh, I, I'm explaining that badly. Anyway, IDA is completely bugged out if you overclock with BCLK, so you can't, you know, like for for convenience, I'm not gonna do that. Um, so anyway, but it would be certainly an option. Like, like I said, like the CPU doesn't really want to run one, uh, 4133, but if I wanted to push it a little bit higher, maybe like 102 BCLK with the, the, uh, you know, 30 times 1.33 ratio to get like 4080 megabits per second, or even one, uh, 102.5 to get 4100, uh, would be an option, and that could actually be perfectly, like, that would probably be a lot more stable than the 4133 ratio at a 100 BCLK is. Other option is that you could take the 4133 ratio and, like, downclock it with BCLK by dropping the BCLK from, like, 100 to, like, 99 or something. Um, so, yeah, but both of those are going to skew your, like, IDA benchmark results, which is why I haven't done that. Um, and also, I think if you're doing, like, a daily setup, you know, raising your BCLK by 2% is, like, not really going to make much of a difference to your performance. So, I you can, but it's just kind of, like, not, in my opinion, not necessarily worth the effort. Um, anyway, let's take a look at the timings. Um, also, for the training configuration, I'm just on auto, except uh, that I have round-trip latency enabled. This enabling round trip latency basically slightly lowers your memory latency because the CPU will try to train the round trip like like better round trip latency timings. Um, one concern with this setting is enabling this on some CPUs will just cause massive instability because the memory controller isn't good enough to do a good job of round trip latency training. 
Anyway, for command rate, we're on 2N. Uh, I tried 1N, I tried real 1N. It does post, but it doesn't, it's not at all stable with this motherboard. And uh, I've just not really fussed to figure out how to get that to work. Um, that's assuming it is even possible to get it to work, so. Um, yeah, then for primaries, we've got 15, 15, 8. Like, TRCDW is, I have a video dedicated to this timing. You should, you should check that out, potentially. But you can set TRCDW very, very low, pretty much on all memory kits. And if I'm not mistaken, the register limit for it is 8. Yeah, and MSI evidently isn't enforcing a register limit. So, yeah. It, the other thing to note with TRCDW is it doesn't massively affect performance because it only applies to write operations, or actually it's not even that. It only applies to activate commands directly before write commands, uh, which means the scenario in which this timing is actually used is relatively niche and not really performance critical as, generally speaking, your CPU is far more limited by its ability to read from the memory than it is by the ability to write to the memory. So, um, while you can set TRCDW extremely low without any negative consequences to stability, it also doesn't really change performance very much. But uh, yeah, so that's at 8. Uh, then TRP's at 15. Um, and uh, yeah, so like solid primaries for, for DDR4 for, uh, 4000 here. TRS at 28, uh, TRFC at 300, then TREFI at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, if you have high operating temperatures in your system, you might want to run your t refresh interval lower at, like, say, 60,000. Um, but, uh, yeah, with the, the fan pointed at these memory sticks and uh, this being on an open-air test bench, uh, I've had no, like, you know, it passed all of the stress tests with 123,000 refresh intervals. So, um, yeah. Anyway... Then we have the TRRDs, which are as low as they go. Then we have the TFAW, which is as low as it goes. TCWLs at 14. This could potentially, like I've mentioned, this could potentially go a little bit lower, but uh, it might affect the tertiary timings. And again, write like timings related to write operations aren't as important to performance as read timings. So, or general purpose timings, like your TRRDs affect all activate commands, not just, re like, yeah, so... Anyway, uh, let's keep going. TCK is at 4. It doesn't go lower than that. We have the usual... Uh, oh, yeah. Also, if you're wondering about all of the timings that are on auto, uh, this is a general issue with Intel motherboards. The Intel memory controller does not have this mem many memory timing registers. Now, a lot of these timing registers do actually exist on the memory sticks themselves, but I'm not entirely certain that the Intel memory controller actually uses the commands that would use those timing registers. So that's why those are on auto. Uh, and actually, from my, my experience, these do not, like the timings that are on auto don't actually really affect performance because the Intel memory controller doesn't use them. Um, I'm not entirely certain why motherboard manufacturers insist on having a bunch of timings that don't really exist uh, in the BIOS, but that that is a thing. Um, Anyway, then for the uh, tear cherries, also known as turnaround timings or back-to-back -back timings, I've seen them called a few times. Um, we've got, you know, 8, 4, 7, 7. Uh, I am setting both the different rank and different dim timing to 7 because I think it's been patched at this point, but I think, I think it was 11th gen CPUs where the different rank timing and the different dim timing were swapped. So, like, four memory sticks were actually using the D DR timing, whereas uh, dual rank sticks were using the DD timing. Uh, either way, the solution to this problem is if you just set both of them to the same value, it doesn't matter if it's been patched or not. So, um, yeah, and these don't go any lower than this. Like, I tried six, and it just causes the system to immediately crash. So these are minim minimized. Oh, I did mention that, like, technically, uh, six is stable, but it doesn't, like, it seems to not be better for performance. Um, like, it... Yeah, in some, in like a few bandwidth tests, it actually hurts performance, and it doesn't seem to really boost performance in any f benchmark that I've run. So that's why I ended up with 8477, even though like technically 6477 is lower. Uh, I can't prove that 6477 is actually faster. Um, whereas there is a couple tests with 8477 that do actually spit out higher benchmark results than 6477. So, yeah. Um, that's why those are at 8477. Then we have the read to write timings. These are all at 12. They might do 10s. Uh, not really, like, 
I'm not really fussed about lowering these a bunch. Uh, then we have the right to read timings. These are at 28 and 24 and then 7-7 for the different rank and different dim. These could potentially go a little bit lower, like 26, 22 or something might work. Um, and it's not going to drastically improve the performance at this point. Um, and then we have the advanced timings. So, right to pre-charge uh, is at 36, which works out to a... Because I'm at cast right latency 14. So, 14... Uh, oh, so my TWR is like 18 or something. This could potentially go a little bit lower. But if you... I, at like 32, it just immediately crashes. So, it doesn't go below 32. Um, and we have read to pre-charge. This is the actual, like... So, th this is a fun one. Um, yeah, so you have this timing over here called RTP, which stands for read to pre-charge. And then you have Intel's version of read to pre-charge, uh, which is read to RD pre, um, which is the delay between the read command and the pre-charge command. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, yeah, so y I've set this to eight. On some, uh, this motherboard I don't think has this issue, but some motherboards do have this issue where if you set the RTP timing, so the, the one that I have on auto, uh, the board won't post. Um, so it's, it's general best practice to just set the RD pre-timing and ignore the RTP setting because depending on the motherboard, it might not actually work. Um, so yeah, RD pre at eight, TXP at four, TXP DLL at four. All, actually, all of the power down enable timings are just minimized, right? So pre uh, actually, this is any command to power down enable is at two. It doesn't go lower than that. Read to power down enable is at 4. Write to power down enable is at 4. They don't go lower than that. Uh, then we have a bunch of timings that don't really do anything. Well, TREFI is maxed out at 2... Uh, TREFI X9 is maxed out at 255, um, which is just for best performance. Also, most motherboards will actually just default it to 255 when you're overclocking, in my experience. Um, and this, this timing basically controls how much the memory controller can, uh, like, delay refresh uh, commands. So... Yeah, anyway, then we have a bunch of timings that don't really affect performance, so I ignore the fact that they exist. Um, anyway, then we have the round-trip latency timings, which I have set to dynamic mode, so that the round-trip latency training option actually works. Um, and if we keep going down, um, we have a bunch of settings that are on auto, because the motherboard takes does a good job of... Ha well... I'm not, maybe, maybe if I fiddled with things like the VREF configuration and termination settings, I could maybe get 4133 to work, but, uh, I'm, I'm not really, like, it takes four hours for 4133 to produce one error. It is not, like, practical from a time perspective to be trying to fix that level, like, that kind of like rare instability is not worth the effort to fix because it takes so long to you know like like you change a setting in the bios and then you need to wait four hours before you find out if it actually made a difference to stability right so that's not really a practical problem to try solve because it's just going to take forever um and it's going to be for like marginal performance improvements because um, going from 4,000 to 4,133 isn't exactly the world's biggest increase in clock speed. Um, anyway, so, yeah, then we have more timings that are left on auto, because the board seems to be doing an acceptable job of setting those. And then I have power down mode disabled, which arguably negates all of the, the, the minimized power down enable timings, but, uh, um, yeah. And the reason we're disabling the power down mode is because... Um, well, in desktop applications, it's just, like, it It basically turns off the I.O. portion of the memory stick um, to save a negligible amount of power. Or, well, not the memory stick, the I.O. portion of the memory chip. And the side effect of that is when you have to wake up the I.O. portion of the memory chip, you get extra latency because that takes time that you wouldn't otherwise have to... Like, you wouldn't, like, there's a wake-up procedure that takes time. So it's better if your memory sticks just never put the I.O. to sleep. Especially since the power consumption difference from, uh, like, a running memory stick to power down enabled is, like, a fraction of a watt. It's, like, 0.2 watts or something per memory rank. So it, like, makes sense in servers. It makes sense in laptops. 
it doesn't make sense in desktop systems, as far as I'm concerned. So, anyway, um, yeah, so that's the memory setup. Um, and, uh, yeah, pretty standard, like, dual rank B-Die things, really. Um, I mean, the primaries are quite impressive for, for 4000. Like, there's some kits that won't really do TRCD15 at 4000, but this is a 3600 CL, you know, 3600 1415 kit. So <laughs> it's some pretty high-end dual rank B-Die, so the fact that it does TRCD15 at 4000 is not particularly surprising. Um, anyway... Uh, next up, the voltages. So I have the CPU at 1.4 volts with uh, mode 7 LLC. This is... Well, well the thing is, like... I, I needed Linpack to pass, and I didn't want to spend a bunch of time figuring out the minimum operate, like, minimum voltage that the CPU needs to run 5.5 gigahertz in Linpack. So, um, yeah. Also, my bigger concern was making sure that the CPU didn't thermal throttle in Y-Cruncher VST, and it doesn't. Well, uh, Linpack has a like a somewhat higher peak power draw. Actually, I think even the average power draw for Linpack is higher. So this voltage is potentially a bit high for... Well, it's definitely too much for this cooling system, but um, potentially the CPU could run this voltage... Like, run 5.5 gigahertz even with slightly lower voltage for, for Linpack and... Well, and VST... But, uh, yeah, I, I, like, I wanted to spend time on the memory overclock, not, you know, dialing in the CPU. And also, Linpack wasn't throttling that much. Like, it was throttling, but not a ton. So, yeah. Anyway, um, let's talk about memory controller voltages. So, I have the SA uh, system agent voltage at 1.3 volts. Um, raising this doesn't really help. Like, I tried all the way up to 1.4 volts when, when trying to get 4133 work to work, 4133 to work. It didn't really make a difference. Um, I also tried less system agent, right? Because potentially it's like sweet spotted. Uh, and now that didn't help either. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure that 1.3 volts is actually necessary at DDR4-4000. Um, but it definitely doesn't hurt. And I'm not concerned about this voltage for like long-term use. Um, in fact, I'd be willing to go all the way up to like 1.45 volts uh, for, for long-term use with 13th gen CPUs on the system agent voltage. But uh, uh, there's also no benefit to doing that with this CPU. Um, and it can roll over if you keep raising the voltage. Um, and I didn't see any like st stability benefits from 1.4 volts or 1.35 on a system agent. So um, yeah, the, the CPU just seems to not really be able to do 4133. Uh, CPU VDDQ, on the other hand, this sweet spot's hard. If I raise this voltage, the system will literally stop posting at higher memory speeds. I'm not sure if at 4000 it would still work, but at 4133, if I set this voltage to 1.35, system doesn't post. If I set it to 1.325, uh, I think it might post, but it's less stable. And uh, yeah, at 1.3, it's like optimal. 1.25 also works, but it's not uh, stable again, so... Um, yeah, like CPU VDDQ, and that seems to actually be tied specifically to this motherboard, because on the, uh, when I was first testing this memory kit with the Gigabyte uh, Z690 AORUS Pro, there, that board seemed to like having the CPU VDDQ voltage all the way at, like, 1.4 volts, um, but, uh, yeah, I haven't, like, I, I didn't spend as much time on that motherboard as I've spent with this board, so maybe that was just, like, a, like, might not have test, like, I didn't necessarily test that quite, uh, uh, quite enough, but, um, uh, yeah, anyway, so CPU VDDQ with this CPU on this motherboard with this BIOS, sweet spots at 1.3 volts. Um, if I lower it, it does, well, I haven't tried lowering it at DDR4-4000, but at 4133 it made things worse. Raising it weight makes things way worse in terms of stability, um, so yeah, 1.3 it is, and that also means, like, if you're tuning DDR4 with a 13th gen CPU, for your CPU VDDQ voltage, you're going to have to sort of test a range of voltages to find which voltage works optimally, because, uh, yeah, it's sweet spots, which is uh, kind of annoying, but, I mean, you're working with an Intel memory controller, what did you expect? Um, to be fair, AMD memory controllers also... I, I should more really be saying you're, you're working with a high-speed DDR4 memory controller. Like, there's a lot of memory controllers that have, like, a weird sweet spots for certain voltages, like... VCCIO can sometimes do that on the older Intel CPUs. Um, 
And anyway, um, the next up I have the CPU PLL bump to 1.02 volts. This can just slightly help with like CPU uh, clock, like core clock stability. Um, because, yeah, I was trying to fix some, like, pack instability early on in the setting up of this memory kit. Um, which is partially why I have so much core voltage. I, I don't think 1.41 volts with mode 7 LLC is actually necessary. But, uh, I didn't really feel like putting too much thought into, you know, dialing in the pack instability. It does seem like it was actually just, like, memory related, but, yeah, too late. Um... But yeah, like, bumping up the CPU PLL voltage can sometimes help uh, core clock stability. And now we finally get to the memory voltages, so DRAM voltage at 1.5 volts, and eventual DRAM voltage at 1.55. So what's going on with these two voltages is the, one point, the, the DRAM voltage itself, this is used for the initial boot up and training of the memory, and then the eventual DRAM voltage is what your memory ends up, like, actually running at once it finishes the training process. You might be looking at this and wondering, oh, why do you need the ability to, like, boot at a different voltage from the voltage that you actually run at? And the answer for that is really, really simple. Intel's memory controller sometimes has issues booting at high voltages. <laughs> so the trick to work around that is to boot at a lower voltage, get through memory training at a lower voltage, and then boost the voltage up to what the memory actually needs when you're, you're running. Um, so, yeah, and typically on most 12th gen and, like, 13th gen CPUs, those issues start somewhere between, like, 1.45 and 1.5 volts memory voltage. So, uh, yeah, with this board, I am actually able to post at 1.5 volts, and then for, like, stability, the memory is going up to 1.55 volts. I didn't actually test if the... No, I did. It errored out in memtest really, really quickly, so... Yeah, the 1.55 volts is actually necessary to be stable with the uh, timings that I'm running right now. Um, right, that being like 15, 15, 15 at, uh, DDR4, 4000. Um, and 1.55 volts on dual, like on Samsung BDI is perfectly fine for long-term use. Uh, you can literally buy Samsung BDI memory kits with XMPs that are 1.55 volts. So this isn't going to hurt the memory sticks. Um, the main concern with it is that dual rank BDI sticks, especially once you start pushing 1.55 volts into them, can run quite warm. And BDI is temperature sensitive. Um, so if you're like, so the main concern is if you're running a stress test for a long time and you start getting like a lot of errors after a really long runtime and you don't have particularly good cooling, it's probably because the memory sticks are overheating. Um, and this isn't like harmful to the health of the memory sticks. This is just like the like internal, like the internal circuitry of those memory sticks just works better at lower temperatures. Right? It doesn't actually mean like, oh, the t memory stick is degrading. It just means like the transistors switch slower at higher temperatures or your uh, actual like memory array leaks more charge when it's at high temperatures. So like your refresh timings will have to uh, potentially get worse or your primary timings will have to get worse, especially TRCD in my experience doesn't particularly like being low at very high memory stick temperatures. Um, so, like, potentially, if you wanted to, like, not worry about cooling your memory sticks, one of the ways you could try to do that is run a really high TRCD. Uh, I would not recommend that, uh, because TRCD is very important for perform. Uh, of the primary timings, TRCD is basically the most important for, for performance. So, um... I would generally recommend that you just use a fan instead of doing weird things to your timings to, you know, negate, like, thermal instability. Um, especially because, like, you, you can literally, you know, you don't even have to put the fan directly onto the memory sticks. I know I like doing that, but if you have memory sticks that you actually want to be able to see, because, you know, they're, they're RGB or whatever, uh, yeah, you can put the memory, like, you can put the fan, you know, above them or to the side of them, because you don't need a lot of airflow. You just need some airflow, and ideally not contaminated by whatever heat is coming off of your GPU. So, uh, yeah, anyway, I've totally overdone this video again, as I tend to do. Um, but yeah, this this Asgard uh, low-key, you know, dual-rank uh, DDR4 kit, like, it's, it's a solid kit of DDR4, and I've unfortunately overclocked it with a CPU that's kind of inadequate for it, which I know might sound weird, but, like, this memory control, the memory controller on this 13900K really doesn't seem to be that great. Um, so, um, uh, 
Yeah, I am going to be doing some more testing with this memory kit. I really, really want to see what it does at like high voltages. Um, so 1.8, like to two, yeah, 1.8 to like maybe even 2.1 volts. I might end up pulling out like the Z490 Apex for that or something. Um, so I'm not sure when I'm going to be making that video because there's like other stuff that I'm working on. But uh, yeah, this uh, this is a very like this is a solid kit of dual rank, you know. 8 gigabit DDR4 Samsung B die. Um, and uh, here it is with a 13900K, which is not really an ideal CPU for it, in my opinion, but uh, th arguably, the, like, it's more relevant than the CPUs I actually want to use it with, right? <laughs> so, anyway, um, that's it for the video. Hopefully this is helpful to you if you're tuning your own dual rank uh, Samsung B die kit on a uh, Intel 13th gen or even 12th gen system because uh, yeah, like a lot of the voltage behavior and like timing behavior you might find with 12th gen is actually very similar. Um, so yeah. Anyway, um, that's it for the video. So thank you to Asgard for sending over this uh, memory kit and uh, Oh, also thanks to my like supporters for making the purchase of the motherboard possible, and thanks to Intel for the CPU. That's it for the video, so thank you for watching. Like, share, subscribe, leave any comments, questions, suggestions down in the comments section below. And if you would like to support what I do here with the channel, I have a Patreon. Uh, there's a link to that down in the description below. There's also the HOC Teespring store. There's another link to that in the description. And I even have a Bandcamp. There's a link to that in the description below as well. And uh, yeah, that's it for the video. Thanks for watching and goodbye.